In this lecture, we're going to talk about Takotsubo cardiomyopathy. So Takotsubo cardiomyopathy is also known as broken heart syndrome or stress-induced cardiomyopathy. But this is essentially a cardiac syndrome that is characterized by transient systolic left ventricular dysfunction in the absence of any angiographic evidence of coronary artery obstruction. And for whatever reason, it's more commonly seen in postmenopausal, so elderly women. Now, we don't know what the exact pathogenesis is, but we think it's caused by some type of physical or emotional stress that induces an excessive release of catecholamines that act on the heart to cause microvascular spasm and dysfunction that in turn causes myocardial stunning. So what this means is the myocardium basically stops functioning. And usually we have regional dysfunction of the left ventricle in which we affect either the apex, the apical portion of the left ventricle or the middle portion of the left ventricle. To see what I mean, let's take a look at the following diagram. So here we have a normal left ventricle. So we have the wall of the left ventricle. This is the aortic valve and this is the aortic system. Now, in patients with Takotsubo cardiomyopathy, we have this excessive amount of catecholamines that stuns the myocardium. Specifically, it stuns the apex of the myocardium or the middle portion of the myocardium. And this creates this ballooning of the apex of the ventricle. And so the shape of the chamber actually changes. And it resembles this jar that in Japanese is known as Takotsubo. So Takotsubo cardiomyopathy was first discussed in Japan in the 1990s. And that's why we call it Takotsubo cardiomyopathy. Now, what, what we also see is we see hyperfunctioning, so hyperkinesis of the base of the left ventricle. So this portion of the left ventricle is contracting too much, while the apex of the ventricle is contracting too little. And so as you can imagine, if this portion of the left ventricle where the aortic valve is located is contracting too much, that can actually cause left ventricular outflow obstruction. So we can have obstruction to blood flow during left ventricular contraction, and this can cause a buildup of blood in the left ventricle that can go back to the left atrium via the mitral valve. And so this can cause mitral valve regurgitation and heart failure that can cause pulmonary congestion. So what are the triggers for Takotsubo cardiomyopathy? Well, many patients have a preceding intense emotional or physical stress. Emotional stresses can include things like death of a family member, a new diagnosis such as cancer, or some type of life events such as divorce. We can also have physical stressors. For example, we can have physical abuse of a spouse. We can have acute medical illnesses such as an infection or acute respiratory syndrome and other conditions that can lead to Takotsubo cardiomyopathy. And we think that people with psychiatric illnesses actually have a higher risk of developing Takotsubo cardiomyopathy. Now, what are the clinical manifestations? Well, many patients present in a similar way to myocardial infarction, so acute coronary syndrome. So the most common symptom is actually acute substernal chest pain. Patients may also present with dyspnea or syncope. And some patients may present with signs and symptoms of heart failure and even cardiogenic shock. So cardiogenic shock basically means we have pump failure, so the heart isn't pumping enough blood to the systemic circulation, and that can cause things like cool and, uh, cool and clammy extremities, it can cause altered mental status because not enough blood is flowing to the brain, and so forth. And actually, if a patient develops cardiogenic shock, they actually have a higher mortality risk. Patients may also present with left ventricular outflow obstruction and severe mitral valve regurgitation because, we, because of what we talked about a moment ago. So you can imagine if we have hypokinesis of the apex or the mid portion of left ventricle at the same time that we have hyperkinesis of the base of the left ventricle, that can actually call, uh, cause outflow obstruction during systole. And so what this means is the buildup of pressure and fluid can back up through the mitral valve, causing mitral valve regurgitation. And that in turn can back up into the pulmonary system, causing pulmonary congestion and signs symptoms of congestive heart failure. If we get an EKG, we're gonna see ST segment 
uh, ST segment elevation in the anterior chest lead. So V1, V2, V3, and V4, because these leads basically describe the electrical activity in the anterior portion of the heart, basically the part that we affect in Takotsubo cardiomyopathy. And then we're gonna see an elevation in cardiac biomarkers, specifically in troponin levels. And so we have substernal chest pain, we have EKG that shows ST segment elevation, we have increase in troponin levels. And so this mimics acute coronary syndrome, so myocardial infarction. So if a patient presents with substernal chest pain, you should have Takotsubo cardiomyopathy on your differential, especially if we're dealing with a postmenopausal woman who has a preceding emotional or physical stress. How do we make the diagnosis? Well, according to the Mayo Clinic, to make the diagnosis, we have to satisfy the, far, uh, the following four things. Number one, we either see new onset abnormal EKG changes such as ST segment elevation in V1, V2, V3, or V4, or we have an elevation in serum troponin level. So either one of these two things have to be satisfied. Number two, if we get an echocardiogram of the heart or we get a ventriculography of the heart in which we assess the left ventricular function, we're gonna see transient left ventricular dysfunction. In 81% of patients with Takotsubu cardiomyopathy, we're gonna have apical dysfunction. In about 14% of cases, we're gonna have middle of the ventricle dysfunction, so mid left ventricular dysfunction. And in many, we're gonna see hyperkinesis of the base of the ventricle. Number three, if we get a coronary, uh, if we get a coronary cath, so coronary catheterization to look at blockages within the coronary arteries, we're gonna see an absence of coronary artery plaque rupture or an absence of coronary artery obstruction. And so this basically uh, rules out myocardial infarction or ACS. However, some patients with Takotsubo cardiomyopathy will have coronary artery disease, but we can still diagnose Takotsubo cardiomyopathy if the coronary artery disease is not in the distribution of the wall abnormalities. And number four, we have to rule out pheochromocytoma, and we also have to rule out myocarditis. So myocarditis can present with wall abnormalities that are similar to Takotsubo, and it can also have increase in troponin levels. And the way that we generally rule out myocarditis is by getting an MRI of the heart. So if these four things are satisfied, we can make the diagnosis of Takotsubo cardiomyopathy. Now, what's the prognosis once a patient develops this condition? Well, actually, this condition can be very serious in hospitalized patients, and so we have to take it seriously. So that's because the risk of severe in-hospital complications of Takotsubo cardiomyopathy is similar to those with acute coronary syndrome. But with proper management and treatment, most patients actually progress and improve. And so most recover their systolic function of the left ventricle in one to four weeks. How do we manage and treat Takotsubo cardiomyopathy? Well, basically with supportive care. So if a patient develops heart failure, then generally we treat in the same way that we treat heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. So if the patient has a decrease in oxygen levels in the blood, so hypoxemia, we can give them oxygen supplementation and, 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 and if they need it, we can also do mechanical ventilation. If the patient has signs and symptoms of congestive heart failure, things like pulmonary edema, for example, then we have to give them IV diuretics to reduce the amount of volume overload. To help decrease the afterload against which the left ventricle pumps, we can give vasodilator agents. And we also give beta blockers and ACE inhibitors. Beta blockers are useful because they decrease the ability of catecholamines to actually exert their effect by blocking adrenergic receptors on the heart. If a patient develops cardiogenic shock, which occurs in about 10% of patients with Takotsubo cardiomyopathy, we have to take this very seriously because this actually increases the mortality by tenfold. And so the treatment of cardiogenic shock actually depends on if we have left ventricular obstruction or not. If we have left ventricular outflow obstruction, then the way that we treat it is by giving beta blockers. We can also treat it by fluid resuscitation if the patient doesn't have any pulmonary edema. 
And if that doesn't work, we have to use mechanical circulatory support therapy. So for example, an, uh, an intra-aortic balloon pump. If the patient does not have left ventricular outflow obstruction, then instead of using beta blockers, we give them ionotropes. Basically, we increase the ability of the left ventricle to actually pump and increase the cardiac output. Just like in the case of left ventricular obstruction, if there is no pulmonary edema, we can, uh, we can give them fluids. And if these medications don't work, then ultimately we have to use some type of um, uh, mechanical circulatory support mechanism. So again, an intra-aortic balloon pump. If the patient has a left ventricular thrombus, so remember, if the left ventricle isn't pumping well, then we can have uh, blood that basically coagulates within the ventricle. And so that can cause development of a thrombus. And if that thrombus breaks off and travels systemically, that can cause things like an MI or stroke. And so if after we get an echocardiogram, we see a thrombus in the left ventricle, or if we have severe left ventricular dysfunction that is characterized by ejection fraction of less than 30%, we have to start them on warfarin therapy. And typically we do about three months of warfarin therapy and this helps decrease the likelihood that a thrombus will break off, embolize, and then cause an event such as a stroke or myocardial infarction. So to summarize, Takotsubo cardiomyopathy is a cardiac syndrome that is characterized by transient systolic left ventricular dysfunction in the absence of angiographic evidence of coronary obstruction or a plaque that broke off and caused obstruction. It's more commonly seen in postmenopausal women that experience either an intense emotion or intense physical stress. It usually presents like a myocardial infarction. So the most common symptom is chest pain. Patients may also have signs and symptoms of heart failure and cardiogenic shock. On an EKG, we're gonna see ST segment elevation, particularly in the anterior chest lead, so V1, V2, V3, and V4, and increase in cardiac markers in the blood. To make the diagnosis, we have to have either EKG changes such as ST segment elevation or troponins. We have to have transient left ventricular dysfunction, more commonly seen in the apex, but it can also be seen in the mid left ventricle. And this is diagnosed by echocardiogram. We also, have, have, uh, we also have to have an absence of coronary disease, such as obstruction or plaque rupture. And finally, we have to have an absence of pheochromocytoma or myocarditis. So the treatment is supportive therapy. So if we have heart failure, we have to treat that the same way that we treat heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. If we develop cardiogenic shock, we have to treat that. But remember the treatment depends on whether or not we have left ventricular outflow obstruction. If we don't, we can use inotropes. If we do, we have to use beta blockers. We cannot use inotropes in left ventricular outflow obstruction because that can actually exacerbate the obstruction in these patients. And then in patients with the left ventricular thrombus or if the ejection fraction less than 30%, we actually have to basically give them warfarin to decrease the risk of thromboemboli.